A game for everyone is a game for no one. This is the masthead that lines the top of Arrowhead Game Studios' website. More than just a brand, the developers at Arrowhead have embodied their slogan into this year's biggest hit. And it's this studio philosophy that has made Helldivers 2 into the successful game it's become. Despite its difficulty, despite its niche, despite its singular focus, Helldivers 2 has encapsulated hundreds of thousands of us by excelling at one particular thing. It's fucking awesome. Look, I don't have to tell you how fun the game is. If you're watching this video, chances are you're probably one of those who were stuck in the server queue just two weeks ago. At the time of writing, Helldivers 2 keeps breaking all-time peak concurrent numbers on Steam, surpassing the likes of Halo Infinite, Destiny 2, and Grand Theft Auto 5. Server capacity has now increased to 700,000, though CEO Johan Pilsted warns that they expect the limit to be reached soon. But of course, like any good game about war, Helldivers 2 is saying something. Through the use of its satire, Helldivers paints a world where we are all victims of the military complex. And we're all in on the joke too. Gleefully spreading propaganda on Twitter and TikTok, we ride our hell pods down to Malevolon Creek to the tune of Black Sabbath's Paranoid, and eagerly spread democracy throughout the galaxy. Death is entertainment. Martyrs are inspirational. The horrors of war are distilled into commercialized clips for democratic recruitment. With blood on our capes and slime on our boots, we smile and say, we're doing our part. It's all meaningless. The Terminid invasion is a fabricated psyop from Super Earth in their quest for oil. Truth is false propaganda against the state. Don't think, just shoot. If you die, walk it off. Reinforce and go again. Fight the good fight, Helldiver. For freedom, for liberty, for Super Earth. And we all get it. We know Helldivers is operating on this constant dichotomy between patriotism and critique. It's the game's charm, after all. We're buying into it. We make note of its Starship Trooper's inspirations and salute the satire before shipping back off to the front lines with an oorah. Who gives a shit anyway? There are bugs to fight. In the muck and mire of military maneuvers is where the game's message rings the loudest. It's the aesthetics of war as a means of critique that reign supreme. Those awesome, horrible, beautiful, terrifying, sublime landscapes of shock, awe, annihilation, and destruction. This is war, soldier. This is Helldivers. This is Sabrum. Researching war in video games is tricky. Whether it be key terms or Google's new SEO, scrolling through the topic nets you a lot of the same kind of stuff. Listicles about the best video games about war, best military simulation in games, war games with the best shooting, the list goes on. Naturally, this type of research leads to the same tired articles about the effects of violence in video games. Don't worry. That's not what this essay is about. Instead, what a lot of these articles fail to consider is how war itself functions as a means of critique. This then begs the question, what is the aesthetic of war doing in these games? Let's step back a bit. Depictions of war are precarious. You never know how war imagery will be interpreted by audiences. And that's true across the board. Whether or not you're trying to use war as a critique, you run the risk of portraying action as a means for supporting patriotism. 
It doesn't matter if the Captain America movie is about rebelling against an authoritarian state, if the US Army helped fund the movie in the first place. And I'm serious, the Army gets final say on how they're depicted in movies if they helped fund the project. They hope seeing the star spangled soldier kick Hydra ass inspires little Sammy who's watching to enlist when he grows up. What's that Tom Cruise? Oh, your new Top Gun movie is a meta textual commentary on the dying mythos of the Hollywood star and how the old guard is the only one that can save cinema? Nope, you're propaganda now. Here's $30 million to make the movie and for your help recruiting new soldiers for the Navy and the Air Force. And guess what? Yeah, that actually works. In a 1993 survey, 24% of recruits said television shows and movies like Top Gun had a strong influence on their recruitment. The power of imagery was too strong. The message failed to translate and recruiters took advantage. War has changed. Imagery is at the heart of any war critique. Visually speaking, it's the most striking. Whether it's landscapes of war-torn cities or balls of fire behind the subject, witnessing war secondhand through imagery forces us to face those horrors head on. The question is, how do you interpret them? For David Shields, war photography fails as a means of critique. In the introduction for his book, War is Beautiful, Shields discusses the dangers of aestheticizing war photographs. After scrutinizing photos published from the New York Times, dating all the way back to 2001, Shields comes to a single conclusion. Over time, I realized that these photos glorified war through an unrelenting parade of beautiful images whose function is to sanctify the accompanying descriptions of battle, death, destruction, and displacement. The governing ethos was unmistakably one that glamorized war and the sacrifices made in the service of war. The photos in question are a lot of what you'd expect. Military tank maneuvers in the sun-kissed sands of Baghdad. Special forces units silhouetted by the backblast of anti-tank weapons fire in Afghanistan. A camouflage soldier falling away from the foreground in a field of flowers. Pretty violence. But what Shields fails to really consider is how the dichotomy is functioning as the critique itself. Images have the power to move. They're loaded with meaning by capturing the frame of real life terror in a tenth of a second. In other words, what is the aesthetic helping to say about war in general? Depictions of war are not an endorsement of war. An Mai Le is a Vietnamese American artist who specializes in war photographs. Exhibited at the Guggenheim and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, her black and white series, Small Wars, captures Vietnam War imagery in all its poignant subtleties. In one photograph, camouflage soldiers surround the plane, cocking rifles aimed at the brush as smoke envelops the scene behind them. In another, explosives flail out from a ridgeline ahead in the night. And then there's the several landscapes. Pictures of tree limbs and shrubs hiding soldiers behind smoke and foliage. The Viet Cong could be anywhere. Charlie don't surf. The kicker? None of it is real. All the pictures are from a Vietnam War reenactment done in a forest in Virginia. On My Lo's project was done as a means to reconnect with her home country of Vietnam to better understand the circumstances of what it was like when her family left in 1975, through photographs and aesthetics. Le says that the only way the group let her photograph them was if she participated. She became the Viet Cong, embodying both the guerrilla of the Vietnamese soldier and the critique she was attempting to create. After 2001, Le was given the opportunity to photograph army soldiers during the Iraq War. In 29 Palms, Le captures the full scale of military action, witnessing the white streaks of fighter planes and night operations, tanks positioned at the front of armed convoys in the desert, and transport trucks kicking up dirt and smoke as it traverses the horizon. Of course, none of this was real, either. Le was given permission to photograph Marines training in Joshua Tree, a national park in the Mojave Desert of California. Despite the authenticity of war veiled behind reenactment and training, 
the critique still functions the same. The intensity of war aesthetics captured in these photographs is still able to foreground the interplay between beauty and war in the same way photos of real war can. The terror is all the same. It's all part of the same machine. In an interview with Art21, On My Love discusses this dichotomy between war and aesthetics, and more importantly, how it's functioning as a condemnation. But war can be beautiful, La says. I think it's the idea of the sublime, moments that are horrific but at the same time beautiful, moments of communion with the landscape and nature, and it's that beauty that I wanted to embrace in my work. I think that's why the work seems ambiguous, and it's meant to be. War is an inextricable part of the history of high civilization. I think it's here to stay. But I also think we need to try to avoid it as much as possible. I was not so interested in making work that you see on the news page, which has the effect of wanting you to condemn war immediately. I wanted to approach the idea in a more complicated and challenging way. It's easy to fall into the trap of aesthetics, to be excited at the boom of explosions, to watch in awe as things explode to bits and burn away. I know, action can be cathartic, no matter how horrible the imagery may be. But it's important to remember that despite how pleasing the aesthetic may be to our senses, we're still meant to think about the message behind the imagery, despite its complexity. In our essay, we call this a critique. For Le, it's a condemnation. Do you know what Art 21 calls it? A protest. Helldivers 2 uses war as a means of protest by satirizing the patriotism that's ingrained in so much of our Western society. Before we even take control of a character, we learn so much about the politics of how Helldivers treats war. Every time you boot up the game, the same PSA from Super Earth autoplays, commercializing our duty to enlist as a harbinger of peace. It's all propaganda. Democracy for the rich is death for the soldier. As a Helldiver enlisting into the program, you're actually much less a soldier for Super Earth as much as you are a product. The opening tutorial screen reads that only 21% of the 48,000 trainees will make it through basic training alive. The average age of the lot, not even old enough to drink. It doesn't matter though. The production of Helldiver assets is within the military's quota. If you can hold a gun and survive for 15 minutes, you're plenty. Off you go. But they don't want you to know this, of course. Truth is a breach of contract, a false propaganda you can't take back. It's undemocratic. And we're hit with this patriotic imagery repeatedly. It's on the screens of our ships, in our comms during missions. I mean, you can't even boot Helldivers up without being greeted by a message telling you to press start to protect. No, oh, I'm sorry, did I say Helldivers? I meant a reel from the United States Navy. What the fuck? War as a means of criticizing our military complexes is complicated. It's easy for a lot of it not to land when the spectacle of Helldivers gameplay is so engaging and, let's face it, just plain fun. At this point, the game basically markets itself, but we have to remember that it's saying something behind all the explosions. And look, Misreads of this kind of critique are going to happen, even with so much of it being on the nose. It's just the nature of the beast. What we have to be wary of is how the line between satire and spectacle can be ultra fine, and sometimes even manipulated by the propaganda machine. What researching war has taught me is that military iconography is only widely accepted when used in support of the military itself. Aesthetics are exempt as a means of critique when they function as agents of the state. Take for example the iconic World War II photo, raising the flag on Iwo Jima. Shot by Joe Rosenthal, the photograph features six US Marines raising the American flag atop Mount Tsuribachi during the Battle of Iwo Jima. It won a Pulitzer Prize. It's a striking photo, gorgeous even, with Joe lucky to even get the shot. He took it without even looking through the viewfinder. But we have to consider the circumstances beyond the photo itself. What happened to the soldiers and how it was used after the fact. Three of the six US Marines raising the flag would not survive the Battle of Iwo Jima. 
Franklin D. Roosevelt, so inspired by the aesthetics of Rosenthal's photo, quickly realized its potential as an extension of the state, stylizing the pose into a poster advertising war bonds. Now, all together, you too can do your part in helping to fund sending young men off to die from the safety of your very own home. <laughs> Death is commercialized. Truth is twisted into propaganda. They don't tell you that the photo of the flag isn't actually the first attempt at raising the stars and stripes at Iwo Jima. Forty soldiers took a flag up to the same summit just hours earlier. The problem? The flag was too small. It needed to be bigger. Soldiers fighting on the north side, where most of the battle was taking place, couldn't see it clearly enough. Patriotism must be visible for all to see. And not just visible, but aestheticized. The first photograph just isn't iconic enough. Now, of course, you see references to the second photograph across media. Some of it is satirical. The cover of Payday 2's historical pack DLC pays more than a little resemblance to the original. And according to The Simpsons, it was Mr. Burns who actually raised the flag at the Japanese mountaintop. The Simpsons actually parried the picture two more times, by the way. The Animatrix's second renaissance showcases humans raising a burning flag as a last ditch effort for patriotism while Banksy uses graffiti to criticize our government and military complexes not once, but twice. And in Starship Troopers 2, soldiers raise the flag while fending off a swarm of invading bugs. Sound familiar? I can't help but think about Anne Maile and her comments about her art. Specifically, what it means to showcase war as an aesthetic, something that can be beautiful to look at but still function as a means of critique. She refers to this as the sublime. Okay, look, I'm not going to get too in the weeds here about the varying definitions of the sublime as an aesthetic, but in order to complete talking about Helldivers, we should at least distill it down to an easily graspable concept. The sublime is an aesthetic experience. One that walks a fine line between witnessing something that is beautiful and awesome as much as it is terrifying. Things that move us beyond reason into awe-inspiring. Oppenheimer watching the bomb explode from the safety of cover miles away. Cooper gazing up at the waves of Miller's planet. Alex Honnold climbing Yosemite's El Capitan free solo. The Sublime. War games typically invoke the Sublime through use of powerful aesthetics. It's genuinely moving to witness the blast of a nuke bring you down in modern warfare. But just because you use imagery that is sublime doesn't mean you're saying something with it. Like on my Lewis photos, the best war imagery uses the aesthetic to actually say something. In Armored Core 6, fighting atop the xylem as it falls towards Rubicon isn't just impressive to witness and participate in. It's made sublime when you consider the act as a necessity to help liberate Rubicon. Awe-inspiring guerrilla warfare. And on the reverse end, you have games like Spec Ops The Line, which uses white phosphorus as a means to scrutinize the immorality of military action. From the safety of a computer screen, you drop chemicals on civilians and comrades alike, not just the enemy. Friendly fire. Your reflection staring back at you as you continue to press buttons to drop more. What's left then but to walk through the scene and bear witness to your inexcusable actions. Actions you must face head on and contemplate. The sublime. Helldivers is operating on this level, between spectacle and critique. Staring up at the crimson sky of the Hellmire system as stratagems rain down on the terminated infestation is only made sublime when you realize it's all meaningless. Freedom is the hand that brings total obliteration to a man-made war using taxpayer dollars. Freedom is the casualties on the front lines of an automaton war who only sought sovereignty and the scary capital S war that is socialism. Freedom is a commodity served in a can for us to buy and restock in vending machines. Freedom is the burning residue and residual ash of napalm on forest foliage. Freedom is the cries of democracy as hot lead splashes in pools of blood soaking dirt. 
underneath the beauty of gigatons of hellfire, it's all cogs from the same machine. But we know it. It's our eagerness to ship out on the next operation that helps sell the joke. We're being exploited in the facade of an intergalactic war for Super Earth's quest for oil and conquest in the name of freedom and democracy. It helps that Helldivers isn't just pretty to look at, but that it's fun to play. That we laugh at a comrade dying at danger close cluster bombs. Because the sooner we realize how fucked up it is that we're being manipulated by the military complex of Helldivers, the sooner we realize the exploitations done to us out in the real world. The sooner we see behind the intent of propaganda. The sooner we can wake up to the grasp of capitalism and utilitarian authorities. As Peelstead says, don't be a fascist. Helldivers isn't just another good war game. It isn't just another sublime experience. It's a rebellion, hidden underneath the veil of capes and combat uniforms, winking at us through the screen behind salutes and aesthetics. Helldivers is a critique, a condemnation, a protest. Helldivers 2 is terrifyingly beautiful. But what do you think? Like and subscribe.